Erica Ball is Mary Jane Hewitt Department Chair in Black Studies and Professor of History and Black Studies at Occidental College. She specializes in 19th and 20th century African American history. She's the author of two books and the co editor of three more, including To Live an Anti Slavery Life, Personal Politics, and the Antebellum Black Middle Class, which was published in 2012 by the University of Georgia Press, and Madam C.J. Walker, The Making of an American Icon, which was published with Roman and Littlefield just recently. Professor Ball's research explores two overlapping areas. She analyzes the ways African Americans use visual print and other forms of cultural production in freedom struggles, and she examines the ways they've engaged the popular memory of slavery, the abolitionist movement, and the Reconstruction era. Tatiana Sejas is Associate Professor of History at Rutgers University, and she specializes in early modern global history, the Pacific world, and Latin America. She's the author and editor of several books and has contributed to many others including Asian Slaves in Colonial Mexico, From Chinos to Indians, which we published at Cambridge in 2014, and it was awarded the Berkshire Conference on Women Historians Book Prize. And she has co-written with Stuart Schwartz, Victors and Vanquished, the second edition, which was published by Bedford St. Martins in 2017. As an historian, Professor Sejas aims to cross historiographical and geographical frontiers to reconstruct the everyday experiences of people who were born without the privileges of power. Terry Snyder is Professor of American Studies at California State University, Fullerton. She's the author of two books and has contributed to many more. Most recently, Professor Snyder has authored The Power to Die, Slavery and Suicide in British North America, which was published by the University of Chicago Press in 2015 and was awarded the Francis Richardson Keller Sierra Prize from the Western Association of Women's Historians. Her research interests include slavery and freedom in US history and memory, race and gender in early America, and early American cultural history. She's currently at work on a book about marriage, slavery, and the meaning of freedom in early North America. Together, the three have edited As If She Were Free, a collective biography of women and emancipation in the Americas, which Cambridge published this fall. The volume includes 24 incredible essays that together have so much to teach us about how enslaved and recently freed women of African descent from the 16th through the 19th century sought and found freedom. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, and I'd love to start by having you tell us a little bit about the book. Um, what is it about and what does it attempt to do and, and why? Um, I, I guess I will start. <laughs> um, um, oh, this is a book that, um, first and foremost, we we call a collective uh, biography. Um, we wanted to to gather as many stories as we possibly could, um, uh, stories about women of of African descent, um, but but think of how they they spoke to each other um, across time and across space. And um, so our title is If She Were Free, a collective biography of women and emancipation in America really starts from, from that premise, kind of pulling these stories together. And, and we have the poster uh, up here just to give you a sense of, of how this worked as, as a collective project. Um, 24 stories um, of 24 women across the Americas from the 16th to the 19th century. I think when you, you ask the question about what is the book about, I think we frame the book around emancipatory acts. So not only is it a book that features the stories of 24 individual women across the Americas, and that is also part of what the book is about, that this is a hemispheric story, it is also a story that's distinct and unique to the Americas. Um, and so what holds the chapters together are is that each author focuses on a particular kind of emancipatory act, whether it's through the courts, right, or through acts of resistance like um, illicit trade or practicing religion, that these are all defined as emancipatory acts. Um, I'll add that um, I think our book is about the power of women to be able to 
act as if they were free. Uh, women who empowered themselves to within sometimes horrifying conditions, who empowered themselves to seek out small places, small spaces where um, they could they could experience freedom. And to be able to have all of these stories kind of come together and for us to be able to see all of these spaces, I think is what is what makes our book so unique and special. And um, I'd love to hear a little bit about um, where the idea for the book came from and how the three of you came together to, to work on it. Well, I, I also, I'll start um, on that one. I think, I mean, part of where the idea came from was from the historiography, right? That the, the historians of slavery have long argued that slavery was a gendered phenomenon, that women experienced slavery in ways that men did not, right? That these are distinct. And we thought about bringing that idea to the concept of freedom, right? If slavery is gendered, so is emancipation, so is the experience of freedom. And so we wanted to look, we wanted to gender freedom across the Americas and its experience, particularly for women of African descent. So I think one of the places it came from was from the historiography and what we saw as sort of a, a an opportunity to talk about freedom from a gendered perspective. And and I would I would add that we were also interested in what what biography can do, what biography can show, what microhistory can can do. Um, we were all working on on our own sort of individual projects that that highlighted the experiences or the life of, of, indiv of an individual woman or a family. And, um, and we ha were having conversations separately, I would add, um, in, in different spaces with each other um, uh, about what biography can show. So we pulled together our interest in, um, in gendering, our desire to gender the notion of freedom um, with our interest in, in what biography can do. Right. And I would add that um, building on Terry said at the very beginning about the historiography, I think we'd all been been reading the work of incredible historians who had um, who had in their own kind of disciplinary area and geographical area who, who were doing these like micro stories. And so you have somebody like Michelle McKinley, all of these um, authors who joined us eventually, they were doing such important work. We wanted to kind of include them in one conversation. Right. Uh, we could see that other scholars were working on these on these stories just to follow up on Tatiana and Erica, but that they were they were happening, you know, sort of Historians of, of Ibero-America were reading those stories, or historians of early British North America were reading those stories, but n the stories were not being brought together across the hemisphere. So I thought, yeah, we saw that, we saw that opportunity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, I know um, from having, you know, edited many books where you're bringing together a lot of work and, and you're, you're thinking about um, sort of collecting things together. The process of putting it together, of getting that right, is always really important and really challenging. Um, so can you share a little bit about that process, especially the parts that had to do with, you know, inclusion and scope? Yes. Um, well, I think we, could, we can also have a little bit of an origins moment as to when the three of us came together. I think Terry was probably the one who joined Erica and myself. We'd never met. Erica and I have actually never met in person. We've only ever seen each other on a screen for the past three years. Um, so um, Terry kind of brought us all together and then we put our minds um, in action to identify people who were doing this kind of work. And so we, um, you know, we work in different centuries. I, I usually write about the 17th. Um, Erica, of course, writes about the 19th. And so 
we knew people who were working in these different time periods and these different geographies. And so we had to kind of call on our own bookshelves as to whom we could invite to join um, the project. So that's kind of how we got started on conceptualizing um, who could join us. Um, and I, I will add that that we we really wanted uh, the the project to to kind of pull together the the work that all of these wonderful women scholars were were producing. Um, you can see from our poster doesn't look the same as as posters often often look, right? You <laughs> look who's who's represented, and um, that was also one of our aims, and and we think we were um, extremely success successful in that in endeavor. It's a nice a nice thing to to see, and we're proud of that. I I think our process also was kind of radical in its um, in its approach in that. Having published with other edited collections, often you kind of get siloed. You're doing one contribution and, you know, one of the editors reads it. But we actually, the three of us sat down with every single author and talked about the first draft in depth. We all of us read. So so it was like a collective feedback from us to the authors. Mm -hmm. And then all of us read the second and the copy edited drafts. Uh, it was it really was a collective project when it came down to the introduction, the acknowledgments, everything else that's in there. We wrote it together. I could not pick out a sentence of the introduction that I thought was mine because we literally wrote it together on Skype. And so that process, I think I, I think of that as a feminist kind of a radically feminist process and approach to publishing um, that I think that makes our volume unique. I think that's what makes it really a, an important contribution as well, is that the, the method or the process by which uh, we, we made the book. Absolutely, I, I would agree. And I would say that um, that is a, a, it's not an easy thing to do as well. So, um, uh, and so um, the title of this book, As If She Were Free, which is, is just a, a wonderful title. Can you talk a little bit about that and where it came from and the meaning of it? Sure. Um, um, uh, as we'd said uh, when we sort of started talking to today, um, we were we were moved by the the scholarship that that folks were producing um, that that sort of highlighted what women were were doing. Um, from my perspective, I was most familiar with with scholarship that was that focused on how women of African descent in the United States were, were, in, were pushing against the, the constraints um, that tried to hem, hem them in. Um, and uh, folks were producing work that showed how, you know, um, even in spite of, of these limits, these women were, were living, right? They were producing, they were fighting, they were achieving. And so um, the sort of, we, we found our subjects but are, uh, we're also doing the same thing, just not in necessarily only in the 19th century, but all the way back uh, in the, the 16th century. And there's this through line of women um, who are fighting, who are campaigning, who are living, who are loving, who are, who are living as if they were, uh, were free, um, despite all of the structural limits uh, placed upon their, their lives, or at least trying to, ach trying to achieve freedom. Right. And they weren't always successful. Some of them were were punished for their efforts, but but they were agents. They were actors. They were freedom seekers. And so that's um, kind of where we, we began. I know Terry and Tatiana want to want to jump in as well. I, well, I think you said that that was a brilliant kind of encapsulation of that. And I, yeah, I mean, I think this when but when you use the word through line, Erica, I think that's really true. I was I think. Uh, Erica or Tatiana said this earlier, we were all working on separate projects, but my subject in the 17th century for children in the 18th century and or descendants into the 19th century, this, there, there is this through line of them pushing against the restraints um, that, that they face in their lives and acting in ways as if they were free. Um, that, I think that is the theme that holds all of these 24 stories together. Right. It's um, 
you know, the, the book consists of the stories of 24 women along with their families. And all of them in their own ways. Most of the chapters are about women prior to abolition. So the as if is very important. It's not contingency. It's as if because it's a time of slavery. And so in all of these stories, we have women who are um, acting um, really in ways that they conceived differently. Right. So I think that that was an important aspect to bring out as well. Um, and so African descended women, as you say, they, they sought freedom, they experienced freedom in a variety of ways. And this book illustrates that in just spectacular, uh, spectacularly rich and insightful detail. So can you talk a little bit about the many meanings and kinds of freedom um, that readers will find in these essays by giving us some examples? Yeah, I think our examples are just so fruitful um, to think hemispherically and to think transatlantically. So the first chapter um, is uh, was by um, historian Chloe Ireton. She's at UCL. And her story um, is about Margarita de Sosa, who's a woman um, probably with Angolan ancestry who her story begins in Portugal and ends in Puebla, Mexico, which is where I'm from, which is another reason why I'm so partial to this one particular chapter. It's about the city of my birth and my, and my rearing. And it's a story about how this uh, Margarita um, buys her freedom, first survives being an enslaved person to a very abusive slave owners, buys her freedom, um, and then sets herself up as a businesswoman, somebody who owns an inn in Mexico, in Puebla. And this is like the 1580s and 90s. It's a really long time ago, and it, her story is, is yet so, so, so fresh, you know, for the remainder of time in slavery. And Margarita, the, 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 the real conversation about freedom there is about freedom from her terrible husband. Because as much as it's a story of her, her buying her freedom and setting herself up economically, it's also a story of her gaining divorce from uh, a marriage that was also um, very, very oppressive and that took away her financial freedom. So in this one story of Marita de Sosa, we have we have a story of like survival of um, of capital using capital to buy to buy freedom to experience freedom, um, and then also a story of a, a woman who who has to break down the walls of patriarchy, right? Who has to kind of uh, and separate herself from her husband in order to truly be uh, somebody who can enjoy the fruits of the labor. So that, that's one of the stories that kind of brings us to life. And I'll build build on on that one, Tatiana, and um, and raise raise up the story of another entrepreneur, um, but in a different century, right? Um, uh, Mary Ellen Pleasant, right? Um, the mother of civil rights in California, a, a 19th century figure who's born enslaved, gains her freedom, and and ends up moving from the the East Coast to California, and and is an entrepreneur, is an investor in California real estate, um, runs a, a boarding house, right? But also, so um, part of the story, and this is a, a wonderful um, story of our contributor uh, Kelly Carter Jackson, um, is about how she sets herself up as as a free woman, how she claims the space. As a free woman in in a pretty um, uh, you know male space, California in the the mid mid and late 19th century kind of gold rush era, and then afterwards, but also uses her her entrepreneurial skills, her entrepreneurship to invest um, in the abolitionist movement monetarily, um, funding the movement, uh, funding John Brown's uh, failed raid on on Harper's Ferry, as a matter of fact. So, so 
she, um, her story of freedom is, is about her own kind of bodily freedom, um, mm -hmm. but it's also about a larger activist community. So mm -hmm. just to expand on that, that definition, yet they are connected across the centuries by um, this, this story of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And I would move the story back into the 18th century to focus on a woman we only know as Marion or Marie. And um, she's an enslaved woman. Uh, she lives in, is her is active in about 1857. And she comes to light. We don't know much about her, but she comes to light as author Sophie White tells us because she's brought in to a criminal investigation. And it turns out that she has been working between French and Spanish settlements, again, as an enslaved woman. And she has organized accomplices. She has engineered a sort of form of patronage so that she has a network of people who are taking goods from one settlement and selling them in another. Um, and she rewards them through huge feasts that she produces. She lives, she, she dies an enslaved woman. She's born an enslaved woman. And yet she exercises this remarkable economic, right, informal network um, right under the purview of the French and Spanish settlers among her and, and profits from it um, and, and creates a space of freedom for herself um, by doing so. So um, yeah, so the 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 material is is just so rich and um, and it covers quite a span of time. I mean, are there themes? Are there common themes though that emerge in the the lives of these women, even though the 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 time span is so great, um, and even though their lives are so different and diverse in so many ways. So I just changed the screen. I don't know if you guys can all see it to feature the timeline of all of our subjects' lifespans so that you, you really do get a sense of women. Um, we, have, we have stories of women who lived, you know, in the 1500s and then also who lived in the 20th century. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a timeline, it's a periodization that is, I think, really ambitious, but that works to tell a singular story about the Americas, right? about us living in a, in a hemisphere that is built on slavery in some ways. Um, and it's a hemisphere um, in which uh, the politics of slavery are still very much at play. Uh, in racial injustice throughout the Americas. Uh, so you asked um, Cecilia about um, how, what, what are some of the, the main kind of themes? How, how can you talk about the, this being a collective biography? And um, I think one of the things that we find that we learn by reading about these women is that uh, wherever there was slavery, there, there was freedom seeking, right? There's this idea in the historiography, um, which is so problematic, I go like this, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, all of a sudden in the 18th century, men thought about abolition and that was the end of slavery. Um, and our stories show that the moment enslaved Africans arrived in the Americas, there was freedom seeking. And um, there has been an attempt by people to be free, to have their families be free, to end slavery throughout this period, right? We have, we have 500 years here of justice seeking. And I think that that's, um, something that we could only tell through a very, very long periodization. I would, I would add to that, um, that justice seeking is often, or seeking freedom is often understood as this individual act, right? Somebody goes into court and pleads a case and becomes free. But I think one of the things that our our collection shows, and this also lasts through the long haul of time, is that 
claiming freedom is is a, is a very much a collective endeavor so that uh, enslaved and free black communities have a wealth of knowledge about what it means to claim freedom. And that knowledge lifts up uh, people who choose to, who try to claim freedom through the courts. Um, there's also outside of the courts, families establish, remember, recall, and retell genealogies so that when they get into sort of when when they may try to claim freedom in a legal sense, they can reach back and say, this ancestor, she was free, we're descended from her, therefore we are free as well. But all that requires establishing lore in a family genealogy that's transmitted orally over the course of generations. And Honor Sachs's contribution in, in our um, collection shows that really well. And also many other people, uh, communities come forward to witness, to testify. I saw this at this time. Um, I know this child was born when, um, when the after the mother had been granted freedom um, to actually try to clarify who has a claim to freedom. So I think that collective, right, the community and the family stands in back or underneath every litigant who tries to claim freedom is a really important theme um, that we see from the earliest centuries through the 19th century that we that that is included in the book. And and I would I would I would add that um, even even the meaning of freedom itself, right? Um, if we if we once we've decided that that these women were freedom seekers, right, across the centuries, um, across the continents, um, then we also need to, to question some of our assumptions about, about what freedom, freedom is, right? Mm -hmm. um, more than land ownership, more than political participation, right? But bodily integrity, right? Um, free, freedom of not just the individual, as Terry was saying, but the family and the community. Um, freedom not simply on terms that maybe those in, in power may have um, decided for you, but um, the freedom to change those, those terms. Um, uh, when we take these stories together, I, I think when we put women at the center, they, they ask us to, to, to get a little less comfortable, right? With maybe the, the more limited conception of freedom that, that we, we just tend to use un unthinkingly and and open ourselves up to to greater possibilities. They weren't limited in, in their thinking, so um, why should we be? Yeah. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the cover, the image on the cover, which is so striking? How did you choose that? And yeah, who's the artist? We actually, um, yeah, there's a, and there is a short essay at the beginning of the book written um, by the curator of the museum that, that owns this particular print. This is a print um, by an artist named Elizabeth Catlett. Um, Elizabeth Catlett was um, born in the United States. Um, she was two, her grandparents had been enslaved. Um, she grew up in Washington, D.C. Um, actually took art classes with um, Frederick, one of Frederick Douglass's descendants who taught art. All of this is chronicled beautifully, I might add, by Joyce Tai in her in her um, essay on the cover. But Catlett um, uh, was er, got her MFA fairly early on, uh, before getting an MFA in studio art was. Um, that widespread and certainly was one of the first African-American individuals to do that in the US. Um, and she became really committed to um, an art that was devoted to uh, politics, right? Radical politics. And she was always unapologetically from her master's thesis forward, unapologetic about her interest in and her concern with black women as subjects of art, right? And that's what she, and so at one point she really, she really, wants to study with the muralist in Mexico. So she moves to Mexico City to study there. And she remains there for the rest of her life. She actually tries to come back to the United States to visit her mother who's ailing and the State Department won't let her in because of her radical politics. Um, so she was 
she, as a person, as a black woman who claims freedom was perfect, I think, for the cover in the way her in the way she lived her life. Um, and she also span, helps us a little bit get, you know, away from we, it helps us span the American America's a little bit, a little bit more than, say, an artist who was definitely from the United, you know, only spent time in the United States would have. Um, this is her granddaughter, Mimi, on the cover. Um, and it's one the print uh, Catlett made it, I believe, in the early in the in the last definitely in the last years of her life. Um, she when she was remained in Mexico City and she has a lot of um, images of the women in that she sees around her in the world of Mexico City. And but this cover is Mimi, her granddaughter. And we thought it fit because so many of our authors claim freedom, not just for themselves, but also the freedom for their progeny to determine their own destinies. And this picture kind of captures that. Plus, it's beautiful. Yes. <laughs> it is. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, and while we're talking about the image on the cover and um, art in general, do you want to say something about how images and figures help the story through, throughout? William? Yes. So this is one of my um, my efforts to have historians um, employ figures in their books um, so that we can imagine history not only by reading paragraphs, but also by seeing. And I've come to this based on my liking books with figures <laughs> that spark my imagination, but also because I think it is really important um, for undergraduate readers, especially for young readers. We wrote, we put this together for a wide public, right? For people who are not historians, um, but I think all of us in, in some place in our heart thought about our women undergraduates. Maybe I just speak for myself. I thought about my women undergraduates and um, I wanted them to be able to, to see um, these lives in different ways. And I think maps are really important. So I want to show you this map. This map is uh, visualizes all the places where our um, subjects lived. And so to be able as a student, as a, as a reader to see the Atlantic and imagine all of these spots as being places where women acted as if they were free, um, I think it gives a cohesion to the story that, that is like a, a visual kind of pizzazz, right? That you can imagine that somebody who lived in Spain then ended up in Mexico and was able to be free. Um, and that you can conceptualize, well, first how big Brazil is <laughs> um, and how it is that there were women um, throughout, this, throughout this now country um, connected to um, Angola um, and, and who, who really um, kind of thought about their own homeland when they were um, talking about, about their own freedom seeking. So this map is one example. Um, and then even something like this. So this is also something that I thought was um, useful um, for teaching, especially to talk about what suffrage means, what emancipation means for women um, in the Americas. Because historiographically, we think about freedom, if we think about it post-abolition in the context of, say, the United States, is for men who have, were once enslaved, who now could own property, and vote, something that was not permitted for women for many, many more decades to come. And that is true throughout the Americas, right? So if we think about emancipation only in the context of uh, the abolition of slavery and what that gives to men, 
it doesn't fit for women <laughs> because women did not have those rights for like a century later. So to see that, right, um, th this table marks when slavery ended in a particular country and how long it took for women to have the right to vote. And it is a missay to say that because that is the time when white women could vote, right? In all of these countries, not only the United States, to say that women could vote in 1953 in Mexico only meant that white women could vote. And, um, you know, African and Afro-Mexican women continue to be and continue to be today very disenfranchised. And the same story, I think, can be picked up in any of these countries. Um, there, can I add oh, <laughs> uh, one, one more um, point about the images, maybe two, two images. One is a, on a personal note, when my parents picked up the book, they said, I love the images and I love the, the charts. Um, and uh, so I hope uh, other readers do, do as well. Um, but our, the chapters also contain images and, and maps that, that our authors brought to, brought to the table. Um, and these are, to me, these are all great reminders of, you know, they, they sort of call out from the past and tell us, you know, we were here. Right. Mm -hmm. We were we were here. Um, I think of, uh, for example, the the freedom petition that Alice Baumgartner's in Alice Baumgartner's chapter. She includes a, an image of a freedom petition by a woman named Minerva. Right. And that's a that's a piece of material culture found in the archive that that tells us, you know, she was here and she she was seeking freedom for herself and her her children. So. That also is a nice way to kind of tether us to, to these subjects. Subjects who, who are hard to locate in the archive, but who are there, who are there. We also have another, in another one of the chapters, in a couple of the chapters, we have the book covers of, right. um, of books written by the subjects. Um, and I think the physicality of seeing a book cover, right? Um, these were women who, in the 19th century primarily, uh, wrote books that touched on what it meant to be free and what's and the legacy of slavery. And so to see their book covers, we have one by um, Fermina Reis from Brazil, we have her book cover. And just to visualize that this woman sat down and wrote stories about um, people who were living the oppression of slavery. And to see the book cover is a testament that that book circulated, that her words mattered, right? That she was read at that time and that we're now reading about her today. And we also have, we don't have very many um, paintings, but we have an illustration um, about uh, the Argentina, the, the mother um, sort of, the mother of Argentina freedom. Um, the, a painting that's done actually from 2013. So it's not, it wasn't contemporary with her life, right? She joined the military, is understood. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, but we, uh, several of the chapters um, also touch on how the women that the authors study are remembered in modern memory. And this is one of them. A second one, um, the Brazilian anti-slavery novelist is has been sort of picked up in modern hip hop. So there's we have a line from that, and then um, a, a, there's another subject who's very roughly been translated into a telenovela. Um, so I think that's important. A lot of these women are unknown to most historians, but may but are gaining through feminist efforts and the efforts of recoveries sort of. I mean, I think recovery is part of this project too, are now enjoying sort of a resurgence and people are beginning to understand who they were um, and why they were important and why they should be remembered and part of the historical record and the popular culture record as well. Uh, so I want to read a comment that just came in. Um, it says, uh, 
I want to assign this intro, I want to assign this to my intro level history majors to know that women were fighting everywhere for freedom. We have a problem recruiting female students to the major, and I want to change that. So um, I think this is, you know, a really great example of um, a book that can help do that. Um, and um, I also think uh, from a publishing sort of perspective that this is one of my favorite kinds of books to publish because it's the kind of book that people will create courses around. You know, it's the kind of book that people who may not be comfortable necessarily teaching a class like this, but would like to, you've given them a tool to do that. You know, you've given them a book so that they can actually base an entire class around this book, even if this might not be their complete area of expertise. Um, so I think that's, you know, I think that we're going to see that happening with a book like this. And I think that's just an, an amazing um, it's, ama it's an amazing thing when that happens, um, because this is the sort of book that um, I think it really will change things. I think it will it'll change the way people um, who already do this work um, will do it. And also people who don't do it yet can do it. And the way students will be introduced to it um, at a much earlier time and in a much wider sort of way than they have been to date because this book exists. So. Um, so that's my, that's my little thank you for for having put this well, book. We so we hope so. Well, something else that I think we've all had in the back of our mind is that we need more women historians to do the work, right? Um, there are so many archives and so much documentation, and we need readers with imaginations who can read a court case, who can read an account book, who can, you know, read um, a letter, a diary, a very, very long court case, and use it to bring to life somebody from the past. Yeah. And I think that there is, I find that some of my undergraduates think that you, you, you can't find these stories, that it's all like gone. And it's not gone. It just needs a lot of, you need a lot of work. And so if we can inspire young women to go get a PhD in history, and that would be like my dream come true. And then they write about African descended women in the Americas. And we have another smart woman who has joined our ranks and not gone into medical school, which is great too. But we also need the smart ones to go to grad school and become historians. Mm -hmm. Well, I think this 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 could be a book that does it for some people for sure. So, um, so uh, and you mentioned before too, you know, besides the academic audience, which is a very important one for this, um, you hope that it will appeal to other audiences as well. So, you know, ideally, you know, what's what's your what's your hope for that? Who else would you like to read this book? I would. I mean, I, I think of I think of somebody browsing in the in the my local independent bookstore a couple of blocks away and browsing through the history section and picking this up in part because it has a very striking cover and a very striking title and picking it up and looking at it and seeing it as um, the kind of book that they would want to engage with, maybe because they're interested in history, but not a professional historian, maybe because they're interested in the history of social activism, maybe because they're interested in African-American history, um, maybe because their origins are not North American, and the year they pick up this book and it, and it has this history that spans the Americas, and that also, reflects the trajectory of their lives. All of those people would be ideal readers, I think, for this book. Um, I, I was I was going to to say, and this is this is a, a less elegant way than you just put it, uh, Terry. But everyone should read, <laughs> like everyone to to to, <laughs> to read the this book. Um, and um, uh, I've. I've, I've actually already tested chapters out on on some of my undergraduate readers who who have um, who really loved it and had had 
wonderful things to, to say and, and great questions to ask about the chapters that they had been assigned. And I'll say for them, one of the things that they have said, and this, this comes from one, two, three different chapters, um, uh, is that they, they felt like they didn't often get the chance to see what uh, African descended women were doing, right? Um, they always felt like uh, they were, these are women who were acted upon, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's a way to, to sh of course, African descended women were, were agents, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's a way to, to see that um, um, if you're new to the subject matter. Mm -hmm. um, um, you see that over and over and over and over again across time and, and space. Yeah. I think for, for a wider audience, um, everybody likes a good story, right? Everybody likes to be able to imagine a, a person's life, you know, that's like, and so there's a lot of really good storytelling in this book. It's very, very talented writers. I mean, if you look at the screen, um, we made all of our authors take selfies um, with their book. And these are really great writers who wrote like these really evocative, um, you know, micro studies, like little stories that, that not only bring the woman to life, but the time to life, right? So that somebody can read a chapter about, um, a woman who lived in Minas Gerais in, um, in Brazil in the 1600s, and she can then imagine that community, right, that mining community in Brazil. And so the evocation um, it, through biography, um, I think, is very important for a wider public, right? so that it's, this is not like, it's not filled with jargon and with historiographical conversations, which is an important part of history, but sometimes not the most joyful reading. And this is joyful reading, I think. Yeah, for sure. Um, just talking a little bit about the history of emancipation more generally, and I think we touched on this a bit, but um, how does centering the experiences of women change that? Um, I, I think uh, first I'll start to, and this sort of touches on a point I think Tatiana made, made early in our conversation, um, but that is we want to, we want to shift, I think the, the temporal boundaries of the story, right? Um, of emancipation, not, not just think of it in terms of organized abolitionist movements, organized anti-slavery movements that, that, often center the experiences of of um, kind of a white abolitionist leadership on both sides of the Atlantic, right? But ex really expand that and and pull the time frame backwards. Is that right? Right? Back into the to the 16th century and and center the experiences of a people of African descent, but in in the case of our book here, women of African descent, and, and make them think about how they are agents in this story. Uh, this long history of emancipation, this long um, abolitionist movement, I'd say. And there are scholars who are who are doing this, right? Um, but um, usually for one nation at a time, right? Um, uh, we think of our book as, as contributing to that conversation. And I would add just briefly that, you know, freedom is often conceptualized still by historians in very in, in enlightenment traditional terms, right? Freedom is access to the vote. Freedom is property ownership. Um, and because that, but, but we wanted to use a more con capacious, I think, and relational definition or understanding of freedom. Because when you're, when those things, when those things, property ownership, the vote are denied to you, does that mean by default you are free? You don't, strive for freedom, you don't experience freedom. I think what we show is women defined it in a varied and capacious kind of way. Um, yeah. Um, and um, I have one more question, then we'll see if there's anything left from the audience, but 
So the hemisphere, the hemispheric perspective that you you use here, um, why should we be looking at, and why is it important to talk about the African diaspora using that perspective? Well, because it concerns the whole hemisphere and because we, we cannot think in the United States, we cannot think that slavery is only something that defines our history. It defines all of the Americas and it is, it is part of what unites us to other countries to the histories of other countries. Um, and it is important hemispherically for us to be able to imagine that all of the Americas is black, right? Um, and that there are African descended people in Argentina, in Brazil, in Mexico, in Jamaica, in the United States who are still feeling the legacy of the transatlantic slave trade and who are feeling the pressures of, of white supremacy. And to see that as a hemispheric story, I think just it, I don't wanna say that it's, it's not unique to the United States. Right? It is something that is so much larger and, and even more pressing if we think about it hemispherically. Yeah, and I think I would add the other, the other reason, another, in, in addition to what Tatiana said, another reason to think about it hemispherically is because across the American hemisphere, slavery was a status that was defined by your, whether or not you were a woman or a man, right? Slavery was lodged in women's bodies. It was transmitted through right, the maternal line, it became inheritable from women. So, from, so it is specifically, I think, what links the hemisphere is that, is that is true, whether you're talking about Argentina or Massachusetts, right, or anywhere in between, those laws exist. And that makes the history of slavery with regard to women and the history of freedom with regard to women um, a hemispheric issue, a hemispheric issue that's gendered, and as Tatiana said, continues to have legacies up to the present day. I'll add um, a number to to sort of round this this uh, conversation out. Um, by 1820, 77% um, of the people who who had arrived in the Americas were African, and that's an extraordinary. Uh, percentage when we think about who who was here and what it means for for the Americas, what it means for this this history, and what it means for um, the role of of women of African descent in making um, this this hemisphere. Uh, so, is there anything any any final comments you'd like to make about the book before before we wrap up? Anything we haven't touched on that you'd like people to know? Well, I think it it came through from all of us, but we really, I don't. We, this is a very special book to me. Um, I I'm not saying it wasn't work and it didn't require a lot of thought and time and effort, but I love this project and I love the book that came out of it. I think it is unique and special and has a lot to say to a lot of different audiences. And I think that came through, but I just, I wanted to emphasize that. I, I would like to say too that, you know, we, we were putting this together at the time of Me Too and at the time um, when we were all asserting Black Lives Matter. And this was our um, kind of, our, our kind of contribution to those conversations, that the, the, the fights by activists on the ground um, kept us going, right? To, to do something within our own, you know, the limitations of being historians. Um, what could we do to, to bring something to that, to those bigger conversations? 
I, I will echo both uh, what you both said and say I agree wholeheartedly and, and just add that to me, this is a the book is a, as a testament to what we can do when we collaborate um, with each other, when we work together and when we stretch outside of our, our, our comfort zones and we and we learn from each other, we can do. Um, really wonderful things. Sometimes the work of a historian is is lonely and we're all in our silos, right? Mm -hmm. Writing independently, but you can do really great things when when you work together. Yes. And, it, uh, and just to also add in a shout out to all of the individual women who are pictured around the poster mm -hmm. because they were part of this process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the poster's incredible. Um, and um, thank you for joining us. I mean, your, you know, your passion for the book and for this work and, and your love for the project does come through. So um, it's been great hearing you talk about it. I'm thrilled that I had a chance to be in even on the very end of it. Um, and I know it's going to do I know it's going to do really well. Um, and I know it, people are just going to really embrace it and it's going to really change things. So thank you for being here with us today.